2008, a year characterized by economic dread, emo phases, vampires, we mu- we music? 2008 may have been a time of cringy fandom or bland VH1 reality television for anyone else, but it was a great year for gaming. gaming. <laughs> this was the year when we as gamers had hit the sweet spot of the generation, that period where things were finally consistent enough for the big names to show up while still being new and exciting. Stuff like Mario Kart, GTA 4, Brawl, Fallout 3, Tales of Asperia, that really prove what beloved IPs can look and act like in next gen, or on the last gen, whatever. So when the next Animal Crossing game is announced with the title Animal Crossing City Folk. What? Animal Crossing in the city? But isn't the original game called Animal Forest? That goes against everything the franchise stands for. It's a revolution. Wait a minute. Nintendo revolution. Oh my goodness. Oh my good. It's Wild World. Yeah, literally just Wild World on a TV and some buildings. Now, sure, it may have been basically the same game as the one that came before it, but does that discount it as a strong entry to the Animal Crossing series? Yeah, it kinda does. Well, I still love this game, goddammit, so today I'm going to tell you the story of Animal Crossing City Folk, the entry everyone forgot. This game just turned 14, so let's celebrate by revisiting it, talking about it, and honoring it with all the love it deserves. Should we do the whole, you know, the title and... <laughs> Animal Crossing City Folk was released November 16th, 2008. Just so I can remind everyone real quickly, New Horizons came out at the beginning of spring, New Leaf at the beginning of summer, and GameCube at the beginning of fall, and thus this and Wild World will always be the winter slash holiday Animal Crossings for me just simply because I played so much during heavy snowfall. They have nothing to do with it really, it was just those holiday launches, but anyway. The game would receive fair reception and go on to sell... Oh. Okay, wait a minute. The Animal Crossing series is not perfect. They've done this, they've done this. It's a very flawed franchise, and we love it despite it all, but after the success of GameCube and the explosion of Wild World, it really seemed like the series had nowhere to go but up. So how did it take its first misstep with City Folk? Well, to get the answer, let's start the story in 2005. You remember our old pal Katsuya Gucci? Well, Gucci Gucci is still riding the high off Animal Crossing, which just sold a Guchillion copies. The upcoming sequel, Wild World, will have a much easier time reaching audiences on the DS and promises to be everything and more but on the go. However, one small thing missing was the ability to connect the two together. Animal Crossing GameCube did indeed have this functionality with the GBA, but the DS is advanced hardware that has no place with those guys. What it could do, though, is maybe connect to Nintendo's next hardware, the Revolution, or what we would eventually know as a little microwavable pastry called the Wii. So Iguchi considers a game that could bridge the two together, but only if Wild World sold a certain amount and- Gee, do you think they got enough sales to, to do that? Is it happening? 2006, the revolution becomes the Wii, and Animal Crossing becomes Animal Crossing placeholder title. There's a bunch of pre-release interviews Iguchi did about how his experience with Wild World shaped what he wanted for this game, but one thing I did find really interesting here is this piece about being able to visit towns when the player is not online. It never ended up in City Folk, but anyone who's played New Leaf or New Horizons will instantly know what this feature wound up becoming, the Dream Suite. Who knows why it was cut, I'm positive it could have been handled by the Wii, but lots of people theorize that the game was rushed for the holiday season, and given everything we'll talk about, it makes sense. Finally, at E3 2008, Animal Crossing is revealed as Animal Crossing City Folk or Animal Crossing Let's Go to the City for PAL regions, coming holiday that same year. Which is very hype, until two seconds later when you watch the trailer and think, Why am I hearing the Wild World theme song? Why are they using the Wild World models? Why is it Wild World? Okay, Nintendo. I know Animal Crossing fans really seem to enjoy doing the same thing over and over with better graphics, but seriously? You got the audacity to combine your most innovative and groundbreaking console with your most inventive and fastest growing series in this time of avant-garde video games and theme it with a city, even with its official contradictory name in Japan being called Animal Forest, let's go to town. <laughs> Go to town, senpai! Yeah, this was kind of a cop-out. If the idea of an Animal Crossing game releasing just three years after the previous game sounds too good to be true, 
That's because it is. City Folk was not a new game. It shared a majority of its DNA with Wild World, which I personally was okay with. But for a series that started with a concept literally so creative that they didn't know how to market or describe the game to audiences, what a fall from grace this was. You had a few comments here and there pointing this stuff out at the time and some other really silly comments. Animal Crossing was my favorite game on the GameCube. The DS version was okay, but I didn't get into it as much. But this version is going to be incredible. Oh my god, nobody tell him. But there were also a lot of people excited, such as that 12-year-old kid out in rural New York who lost his copy of Wild World and saw this as the perfect opportunity. He would reread the preview of his Game Informer magazine endlessly because he could just not wait for Animal Crossing in the city. But he spent his money on Tales of Symphonia Dawn of the New World, which came out the week earlier and was a mid-sequel. I mean, I guess they both were. November 16th, the game launches, and when I say launches, I mean it tried to. Apparently, for some reason, nobody really liked that the Animal Crossing game they had been playing for three years was trading portability for an up console port that costed 15 more dollars and removed a lot of the cool stuff. Crazy, right? So it flopped, and you need to understand what a blow this was to Nintendo. When I say it flopped, I mean this is how much the Wii sold, and this is how much the incredibly popular Animal Crossing franchise's iteration on the Wii sold. Compare it with Wild World, it's a humiliation fetish. And you can tell Nintendo was hurt because one, they actually acknowledged it, something they rarely do but would be doing a lot for like the next nine years, and two, they made New Leaf. But we've already talked about that. I think it's time, guys. Let's finally sit down with City Folk so we can pick it apart and not just mention it for like three paragraphs at the end of our Wild World video. So without further ado... Animal Crossing City Folk starts you off on a bus. This is important. Each game uses different transportation that serves the image of that setting, and buses are typical to the city. Good job. You arrive, get a map and a house, then they give you a tutorial by having you work for Tom Nook. It's literally Wild World. But even as early as this point, you've probably begun to notice ways it's not as good as Wild World. The controls. I don't think this is a hot take, but City Folk has the worst controls in the series by a long shot. Motion Control Era Nintendo decided that you can just use the Wii Remote to turn Animal Crossing into point and click controls and use the motion for tools. It's ass. It is especially ass in the design department, which really sucks because one of the cool new things City Folk introduced was pro designs, but there I go getting out of order again. Now you can plug in a nunchuck which gives you direct control of your character and is 100% the definitive way to play. But no classic controller or GameCube support? What the hell? It would have been so easy, but nah, USB keyboard instead. So here you are, working for Tom Nook, running around the town and starting to talk to the villagers, and then the next two downgrades are revealed. The first one being running, a la grass de tier re Okay guys, let's do this. De, tier, e, or, ation. Grass deterioration. Yo! Oh my god. I'd like to thank my brother, my mom, she's cool, my dad, nah, screw that guy. I feel like grass deterioration has been explained enough, but if you're not in on it, just imagine sentient grass that personally hates you so much, it just fucking leaves. It just goes away and only comes back if it thinks you're gone because it cannot stand the very sight of you. And the second one being the villagers, which Nintendo completely lobotomized. Oftentimes, people view New Leaf as the first game to really dumb down the villagers, and they are incorrect. New Leaf is the first game that people actually bought that dumbed down the villagers. But the gap in between Wild World's villagers and City Folk's villagers, especially for a game based on it, like you had it right there, you didn't have to change a thing. But instead, they made them extremely nicer, and very repetitive. And very repetitive and very repetitive. Probably related to all the pressure they were receiving after Wild World with characters like Rossetti, I get why they brightened them up, but I don't agree. However, what did anyone gain from making them so repetitive? Was there perhaps not enough time to write new dialogue? Ayy. Also, they removed the villager photograph system that Wild World had, which I guess is fine because I don't want to talk to you guys anyway, you fake-ass bitches. It just feels like City Folk's villagers are so less expressive and cold. You could even say they're... City folk. But they aren't completely useless. They still drop interesting dialogue here and there and play games like hide and seek with you, they come visit you, they ask you to visit them, and you can bring them medicine when they're sick and rub the moral high ground right in their faces. You can also wave to them by clicking on them with a Wii remote, which is pointless, but oddly intimate. Hey Pearl, coming at you with them mixed signals. Hey, Serena. 
Real quick rant in the argument of this game actually having some personality, but I don't think there is a better way to talk about mixed signals than with this character who was introduced and then quickly killed off all in the span of a 200 megabyte experience. On one hand, I really love her because she represents the temperamental side of Animal Crossing dialogue and talking with her feels like negotiating with a demon in SMT. A demon. And that's the same reason I despise her, because it's all down to luck even with the correct dialogue choices and 90% of the time she laughs in your face and steals your stuff. I've done this at least a hundred times in my life, all for a damn golden axe on the second genesis- Oh, they made her a chihuahua because she's so small but has the personality of a damn water fountain. I got off track, okay, we were talking about the gameplay? In summary, the NPCs aren't terrible, some of the new ones are actually really charming like Wisp or the bunny from Silent Hill, but it's very unlike the meaningful relationships you built in Wild World. Now where were we? The job segment continues in the exact same fashion, I remember as a kid and even now playing this segment that is hardly any different and just feeling so content. I don't even care that it's the same thing over again, I loved it the first time and just as much this time even if it felt like I had already lived and explored this town previously with much better controls. Honestly, that's how I feel about most of the activities in City Folk, whether it's catching bugs, trying the garden, designing the town. They may have lost the spirit of Wild World, but it's still the base game underneath and it looks so much better. Seeing the Wild World graphics in 60 FPS was a joyride, their massive heads staying perfectly balanced on their skinny little mushroom body. But the trade-off that's become apparent by now, I'm stuck here. Animal Crossing on console is amazing, but the portability that Wild World introduced makes so much more sense. You can play it in short bursts, simply close your DS and pick it up again whenever or wherever, even with friends locally. And it's $35 at the exact same time this one launched for $50 to $70, with the DS living for at least two and a half more years. I personally think this is what killed most of City Folk's sales. A more expensive console counterpart wasn't ideal when the original base game was still widely available and supported. Even Nintendo figured that out when they made this game a Nintendo Select in 2011 for $20. But still, was there anything warranting it being on console? The big switch here was the city, and perhaps the magnitude and quality of a city was better correlated with that of a home console. Perhaps. I really did have high hopes for the city, and I genuinely still love it. It has some of the most unique and nostalgic atmosphere in all of Animal Crossing. You will visit this place once and completely fall in love. But it has a lot of problems, so let's go through them. When you're ready to go to the city, stand on the platform and call the bus. Why did they need a gate to go to other towns when they could have just used the bus? Because Nintendo. On the bus, you'll have a nice conversation with Cap'n, but it is not skippable and plays both ways. I love Cap'n, but with how much traversal is needed between the two areas, my god, shut up! Once you get to the city, which is basically just a small plaza, seeing the Animal Crossing charm is... Honestly, pretty surreal. They've got all these buildings and characters walking around, there's this skunk I've never seen before, or this dude handing out balloons. They even have a rundown part of the city to show that poverty is canon in the ACU. If the goal here was to overwhelm the player with options much akin to how an actual city infringes on sensory overload, then I'd say they nailed it. Until you start visiting some of these shops and realize they're just the special visitors from Wild World. Red has his own place, Katrina has hers, Shrunk, Gracie. Yeah, characters like Sahara or Wendell still visit the town, but having all of these people in a known location at one time really kills off the random incentive. That is, logging into the game each day to see if anything is happening in town, because it isn't. It's happening in the city and happening always. Once again, stomping on any reason for the player to check back at random times, but it goes a step further than that by removing the world building aspect. The real problem with the city is that it just hands everything to the player. You're not upgrading shops with your patronage so that you can customize your hair, that stuff is just available to you from day one. It would be one thing if City Folk had done what most follow-ups do and add in more things so that there's a balance, but the issue is the lack of unlockables. GameCube had so many with NES games and gold statues, Wild World had villager photographs. But City Folk has just the typical stuff, the house, the store, some tools, and some structures. It doesn't really offer any rewards to the player past that. And I'm not saying more unlockables make a game better, but New Leaf going dummy with shops, badges, a third type of creature, house mods, customizable furniture, special content, yeah, there's probably a correlation there. After all, Main Street is pretty much the perfected version of the city, and I can take friends along. But the music! The music makes everything worth it. Just come here and listen to the music. Look.
This game really is special to me. I don't want to be too hard on it, and I think most people generally are. City Folk can basically be seen as a mistranslation of Wild World. It took what was already great and then messed it up by changing things that didn't need it. Although, that's not always the case. There are several things that City Folk does better. For one, it brought back holidays, which had to be one of the larger complaints from Wild World, and thank god. I honestly couldn't imagine Animal Crossing life without Toy Day, especially with how the city feels in wintertime and actually going to the city in wintertime. It also brought back cliffs and slightly increased the map size. Each player could have their own house, which were a tad smaller but fully theirs, and a bunch of villagers cut from Wild World also came back. What you might be catching on to here is that these returning features are actually sourced from Animal Crossing on GameCube, which makes sense as it was the last Animal Crossing game on a home console. A lot of Wild World's complaints were related to the pocketeering of the series, aka watering down a lot of GameCube's legacy due to limitations of the DS, or just because they didn't want to. And while I I find Wild World to be beaming with personality, the shift is kind of obvious between those two games. Flat, isometric, and very pixelated. But City Folk corrected this, suiting up its appearance for a return to the big screen, something it undeniably got right that I don't ever see people mention. This game looked amazing in 2008, and it still holds up to this day, but if you take a look at Wild World, ooh dear, that frame rate. Because of this, you could technically view it as a cross between the two, and that's why I enjoy it so much. The size and scope of GameCube with the music style and customization of Wild World, it was a nice way to blend all the ingredients that we enjoyed up to this point. And yeah, me masks, pro designs, new creatures, new villagers, new furniture, and a bunch of quality of life stuff. I'm not saying these things balance out for what City Folk is missing, no, not by a long shot. But what I'm saying is that it's enough to make it feel like a separate experience than both the games that came before it. Aguchi and team always planned it as a component to Wild World, it's even got the suitcase option, but they didn't plan it to just be Wild World, rather an experience that old and new players could both enjoy. If the question is will I still enjoy City Folk if I've played Wild World, the answer should be you will enjoy it more because you played Wild World. Alas, I suppose not everyone found something entertaining about this game to each their own. But I hope if there was anybody out there like that, they did what I did and found each other. Two thousand and eight was also a blossoming time for online multiplayer. Games like Call of Duty Four and Halo Three had just come out at the end of the year prior, and with games like GTA Four the coming year, it felt like everyone was copying a mic and some Xbox Live so that they could pwn some noobs on Guardian. Then you had Nintendo. If Nintendo is still stuck in 2008 today, then back then that puts them in like, what, 1972 or something? Did Mario Kart Wii have voice chat? Nope. Did Super Smash Bros. Brawl have voice chat? Nope. And Wii adopters were quick to let Nintendo know that they were not happy, as if friend codes were not already enough of a reason. These multiplayer-focused games hardly seemed to embrace the potential of the internet, so Nintendo knew they had to do something with this game or risk press suicide. And what they came up with was called the We Speak. First, let me tell you something before we get into this part. Animal Crossing City Folk had the best multiplayer at this point, and probably still to this day has the best or at least easiest communication. You could type messages with an actual keyboard plugged into your Wii, but this was also about to become the first Wii game with voice chat. There was just one problem. Traditional old-fashioned Nintendo valued a family safety model above all else. Makes sense, a lot of their core audience is made up of kids. And as an 11 year old who spent every day on Xbox Live that summer, I could not imagine the brutality those kids were destined for. So what if Nintendo could make a microphone that disabled the privacy of the commonplace headset, where the voice chat came through the audio of the TV, that way nearby family could be alerted to anything sussy or aggressive. Better yet, the device could also input from the entire room in case someone else needed to intervene. It also benefits multiple players using one screen who wouldn't need separate headsets and being stationary breaks significantly less often. This was the Wii Speak, and it was supposed to do exactly that. The concept was genius. The execution was putting it above the fucking telephone. What? Bro, are you hearing yourself right now? Literally? Literally? Uh, so everyone seems to have a different story as to why the Wii Speak sucks. Once again, mine personally worked great for me. But a lot of others said you needed to shout at it to compete with the TV, and if you were a kid, you probably had no respect for background noise. The quality was also piss poor, but it's 2008, dude. Like, what did you expect? You're not even playing on an HD console. Funny enough, for how many people had problems with the Wii Speak, it became an item of status, with several of the friend code exchange threads and videos only adding other people with Wii Speak. Oh, and in the Wild World retro 
perspective, I commented on how the Wi-Fi for this game was shut down after a pathetic five and a half years, and a lot of you were quick to correct me. You don't need homebrew for multiplayer, you can just use WeeMooMooFi. And I tried to do this, but I guess my router type is too new for a 2008 Wii game, so I don't know what to do now. I guess I'll go back to playing Pocket Camp.